Hello again folks and welcome to a screencast on biomechanics and this particular screencast we're going to be looking at levers and lever systems. Lever systems are the coordination of our bones and muscles in order to create an effective motion or movement. And there are two main functions of lever systems. The first of which is the lever needs to generate muscular effort to overcome a given load. So basically it needs to help the muscle contract to lift an item or to move a load. And the other function of a lever is to increase the speed of a given movement. So if I want to move a limb fast, a lever will might help me do that in the body. Lever systems are made up of certain components and you'll need to know these for your exam. So the components are as follows. You have the lever itself. So in this human body, the levers are the bones of the human body. We have what's called the fulcrum. And again, using the human body, a joint would be a good example of a fulcrum. So the bones being the levers, the joints being the fulcrum or the pivot point. The next concept we have is called the effort. <clears throat> and this would be the muscle contracting at the joint, which causes the arm to move. So that's the effort. And of course, finally, we've got the load, which is the amount of weight or the resistance that we are trying to move or to lift. So for example, if you had your arm and we're looking at the elbow joint, the lever might be the humerus or the radius or the ulna. So they would be the bones at that joint. The fulcrum would be the hinge joint. So you can see there's a green triangle there. That's the fulcrum. The effort, well, that's the bicep brachii. As I bend my arm in, in half, and I'm trying to lift the weight, it's the muscle that's bringing that bone upwards. So it's moving that lever. And therefore the bicep brachii is contracting there. So that's the muscular force. And the load, of course, would be the, the heavy dumbbell that I'm trying to lift on the end of my arm. We've got certain categories of levers and they're basically numbered and what I'm going to do is go through each particular lever you'll need to make some notes on the lever and at the end you'll need to draw a simplified diagram of the lever please also make sure you write down some examples of each lever as I discuss them from sport so to start with we have what's called first class levers a first class lever has the fulcrum, so the axis point, is in the centre, in the middle. And therefore the effort and the load are either side of the fulcrum. A good example of this is the neck joint in the human body. So the fulcrum would be that pivot point, actually the, the pivot joint in your neck in fact where that green triangle is on that image. The effort would be the muscles in the back of your neck and leading on to the trapezius and the latissimus dorsi that would pull your neck and head backwards. So that would be the effort in this sense. And the load would be the weight of your head in terms of the front or the chin area. That would be the weighted load. The reason why, if we're looking at the neck joint, this isn't reversed when you move your head forwards, is because gravity brings the load down. So we don't actually need too much muscular effort on the front of our neck to bring our neck down, as gravity will support doing that. But if I want to move my neck backwards, it's the muscles in the back of my neck that help move the load, which is the, my face and the head, 
backwards. A really good sporting example of a first class lever would be an individual in football performing a header. So moving the head backwards to perform the header. The next form of levers are second class levers and second class levers this time have the load in the middle and that means the effort and the fulcrum are either side of the load. Here is an example of that. So you've got the fulcrum is right on the toe joint. Uh, the load going through the middle which is the weight of the human body and the effort on the end, which is the muscular contraction, which in, in this sense is the gastrocnemius or the soleus, in order for me to plant my toe in this manner. And a second class lever helps you lift a lot of weight with not a lot of effort. And we'll come back to that later on. A good example of a second class lever would be an athlete, looking at our picture, an athlete taking off at the takeoff board in long jump or an athlete uh, using plantar flexion in order to jump upwards in a basketball jump or a high jump something like that so that would be a very good example of a human body second class lever sporting example finally we have third class levers third class levers have effort in the middle and therefore the load and the fulcrum are either side of the effort. So it's the last combination that you could do with those three elements. Now a good example of this is an upward phase of a bicep curl. Be careful with that statement. Make sure you write the upward phase of a bicep curl. And the reason is, as you move the bicep curl upwards with the weight, if you try bending your arm now, the bicep brachii suddenly, slightly, becomes ahead of the, the elbow. And so that means the effort, which is the bicep brachii, is slightly ahead of the fulcrum, which is the elbow joint. The load is obviously the weight that you are trying to lift. And a good example of a third class lever is if a footballer or runner uh, bends their leg backwards at the, at the knee joint. So for example, if I'm going to kick a football and I bend my leg back, the bicep femoris is contracting and that will be the effort. The fulcrum will be the knee joint and the load might be my foot and ankle because I'm lifting my leg backwards. It's exactly the reverse of this bicep curl, just the other way around. Okay, so two good examples there with a third class lever, a bicep curl in the upward phase, the upward phase only, and a footballer bringing their leg back or a runner bringing their leg back in a running action or football when they're kicking the football forwards. With all of your levers, the examiner won't ask you to draw an upward phase of a bicep curl. They'll ask you to draw this through a simple diagram and we call those a lever diagram. And a lever diagram looks like this. So you have a long line, which would be the lever itself, so my purple line. The joint, which would be the fulcrum, is always a triangle with an F underneath it. The load is always the letter L with a downward arrow. And the effort is also always the letter E with an upward arrow. And so this diagram would show you a first class lever because the fulcrum's in the middle, the effort's on one side and the load's on the other. What I'd like you to do in your notes is then draw a diagram for a second class lever and followed by a diagram for a third class lever using this principle of FLE. If you get stuck in remembering what does what, there's a nice little chart here to help you out. So remember the levers are lines. The fulcrum is always a triangle with the letter F. Effort, the arrow and the letter E. And the load, an arrow and the letter L. And you can go back to the image prior to this to help you out with 
that system. The last thing we need to discuss about lever systems is what we call the efficiency of a lever system. This is where the distance between the effort and the fulcrum and the load and the fulcrum is really important because the different levers have different distances between the effort and the fulcrum and the load and the fulcrum. The distance between the fulcrum, the F with the triangle in your simple diagram, to the effort, the E with the arrow in your diagram, is known as the effort arm. And the examiner can ask you to draw the effort arm into your lever diagram. I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. Similarly, the distance from the load, that's the L and the arrow in your diagram, to the fulcrum, the triangle and the F, is known as the load arm. So we've got these two things, the effort arm and the load arm. And the examiner is going to want you to put those onto a simple diagram so you understand those concepts. The greater the distance of effort or load from the fulcrum, the more significant the effort or the load is. And again, I'll explain that in just a second. So looking at the diagrams for load and effort arms, if you were asked to draw a diagram to include a load and effort arm, you would always start with the lever diagram first. So if we did a first class lever, here's what we would draw, and we've done that bit before. So that's my first class lever diagram. I now need to add in the effort arm. So all I do is I draw a line from the F to the E with an arrow, and I label it effort arm. Okay, so my effort arm has now been labelled on this diagram. You would then, if I want to do the load arm, do exactly the same thing with the load arm line. You would start your, di start your line from the F and lead it to the L in the load arm, and you would label that the load arm. So my completed diagram of a first class lever with the load and effort arms in would look like what you see on the screen now, and that's the whole diagram that the examiner would want. They may ask you to do this for a second class lever and a third class lever, so can you also please add those in to your second and first class lever diagrams? Okay, let's think about levers for a second then. If I've got a very tall individual playing tennis who might be something like six foot five, their arms and their legs are probably likely to be quite long. And so if we're looking at the arm with the racket in it, that arm is particularly long, meaning that that lever is very, very long. Now, that causes two things to think about. Number one, if this person is serving with a long arm or a long lever for an arm, they may take longer to move that lever to hit the tennis ball because it's a longer arm, it's a longer lever. So it might take a bit longer to move that lever in the first place. However, when they hit that ball, because of that long lever action, they can generate much more force onto the ball and therefore they have a good advantage of that lever system. They can also throw the ball higher, as you can see, and that enables them to get a better angle because they've got a more efficient lever to use in terms of generating power onto the object. If we compare that to someone who is slightly shorter as a tennis player, the shorter tennis player's arm with the racket in it, now that person's lever arm is shorter. Now on the plus side for that, his service action is going to be faster because he can move that shorter lever quicker through the air to hit the tennis ball. However, he would not be able to generate anywhere near as much force as the taller player 
because the lever is shorter. And so now we start to think about what are the advantages of certain lever systems. And it's all to do with the length of the effort arm or the length of the load arm. And what we say is, depending on which one is longer, would give a lever a mechanical advantage or would give a lever a mechanical disadvantage. So let's look at some individual levers and talk about this. When we're talking about mechanical advantages, it only really applies to a second class lever and a third class lever. So we're not going to be talking about first class levers at this point. Why? Well, because the effort arm and the load arm are the same distance away from the fulcrum in the middle. So there's, there's no difference. So let's think about our second class lever and let's think exactly about going up on our tiptoes and pushing all our body weight upwards through plantar flexion. The second class lever here, if we drew a line from the load to the fulcrum, it's shorter, the load arm is shorter than if we drew a line from the effort to the fulcrum. So the effort arm is therefore greater than the load arm. What that means is that that second class lever has what we call a mechanical advantage. It means I can lift a very heavy load with very little effort. That's the advantage of that joint and that's the advantage of a second class lever. Now when you think about that and look at the third class lever, you can suddenly see some of the differences. On my third class lever, when I'm doing a bicep curl going upwards, the load arm is greater than the F arm. Because remember, when we curl the bicep upwards, the, the bicep brachii becomes just in front of the fulcrum, or the hinge joint, and therefore you've got a very, very short effort arm, but a very long load arm. And so what we say for a third class lever is that gives us a mechanical disadvantage because it takes much more effort, because we've got such a short effort arm, it takes an awful lot of effort for that bicep brachii to lift the load put on the end of the arm. And so the second class lever has a mechanical advantage, but the, the third class lever has a mechanical disadvantage in that respect. What I'd like you to think about before the end of this screencast is if you had to give an advantage of the third class lever of an upward phase of a bicep curl, what would it be? It might be relative to think about that tennis player in terms of that lever, because by having that longer lever, the third class lever, what would it allow that tennis player to do, which I mentioned earlier on? And in terms of the second class lever, are there any disadvantages of that lever? If you think about a mechanical disadvantage. So things to think about there before we finish this particular screencast. Thanks again for watching the screencast and as per usual if you need any more support with OCRA level PE or biomechanics in general please head to the ISB PE channel on YouTube.